Teller. Hi, welcome to the Digital Leadership Podcast. I'm happy to have you here. How are you doing? Fantastic. How are you? It's great to talk again. Yeah, that's great. Like I know we talked yesterday about something else totally different, but it's good that we are we're talking about uh, the subject today about education in uh, product management. Quite an interesting topic. So before before we start, can you can you present yourself and uh, tell a little bit about you and your uh, your background in product? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Taylor O'Neill. I've been around the block in consulting for quite a while, uh, ranging from all the the different type of PMs, which is a whole can of worms, you can maybe get it to another time, um, but uh, has been around all sorts of clients from e-commerce to manufacturing to everything you can think of, um, and then always was passionate about creating better digital experiences for customers. So that is what really led me to product. And uh, I've been a consultant most of my career, except for a little gap during uh, the COVID year where I worked for a travel company. Uh, in hindsight, maybe that wasn't the best choice, but uh, a lot of learning and a great team actually there as well. So super excited to talk about product management and education today because I decided actually after the last five years, I taught digital analytics uh, remotely for a university in Ohio, Miami University. And then, you know, I always wanted to teach product as well. So I'm passionate about a lot of those subjects. And so this fall, I had the opportunity to create a curriculum from scratch and teach that asynchronously to a bunch of students. And so much comes up in that. I know I've taken a boot camp back in the day and we can talk a lot about, you know, how that used to be for, for us and what we've taken and what it looks like now. And then maybe, you know, what it looks like in the future. And so you, you have a channel also, right? You have a, you have a YouTube channel. So what is your, uh, can you say, what is your nickname? We will repeat it at the end, but uh, if people want to follow yeah. you. Yeah. On YouTube, I'm uh, at Grizz with two Z's PM. So, you know, a little bit of a grizzled beard, uh, a little bit of Riz, a little bit of game is what they're calling it these days. And uh, also Grizz the DJ is a uh, great EDM DJ if anyone wants to listen to music. So a little inspiration there. But um, all of my curriculum, I'm trying to get to, you know, publish in public, kind of like we talk about with a lot of those things, because there's a little bit of, you know, more pressure to do really well and have something that lasts. And, you know, for a lot of other reasons, it's nice to have some things out there to do things like this and meet other people. So I like to craft videos based on the curriculum we built out there and and make it so it is tailored kind of to more of a like you know intro audience so that a uh, university student like wanting to learn about product management that they may either be jumping into right now or a little bit later so there's quite a spectrum of niches on where we hit even on you know these channels and, and everything where I'm trying to land trying to get a little bit of the advanced material snuck in there but uh, just kind of a, an intro that makes sense and that's like practical did you how did you come up to do that at a university how did it how did it start yeah absolutely so it's a really unique program I know only a few universities have like a really cross-disciplinary program that I think really actually in a way is like the role of product management where we're touching all of these different functions and our program is called emerging technology and business design uh, it used okay. to be called interactive media studies back you know 10 years ago and they were some of the first to really like look at these functions like you know UX even like 2006 7 wasn't really there in that form it was maybe human computer interaction or some of the other things you'd hear in academics that were more around user research and, and looking at heat maps and things like that. But I didn't really see it where it was connected to like web design, I guess, at the time. And so this program really came out of like, how do we merge, you know, the creative arts with business and marketing and the, you know, technical sort of uh, STEM skills in one place. And so they've, a lot of things have come out of that, like uh, esports athletes are the first to like sponsor uh, those and give them varsity uh, scholarships and things like that. So there's a lot of fun we have in the program and that sort of gives us a little bit of creative freedom to work with real businesses and connect these functions. So I'm really actually speaking more to the designers than the engineers probably in my curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of the digital marketers that are the ones that are like really forward thinking, a little bit less of the product price place promotion sort of deal and more of how do we get that, which is a huge gap, I think, in, in most university education. And is it something that you saw that I mean, do you see like more people being interested in product management or do you see more people being interested in that field? Or is it more something that was coming from university that was like, you know, there is a need in the market and so we need to do that? I think it's, it's kind of a mix. I mean, I don't think they're really aware of all the roles. Like I really try to do actually even an exercise week where 
you know, you have all these employers coming to you know, campus that are uh, in October for like jobs that they sign up for in the summer, which is really only a handful of jobs like, you know, the PNGs and, and the Deloitte's and Accenture's and that kind of thing. But just career pathing and like looking at LinkedIn on people like us looking at, you know, how, how did they get to product management? What are the options? Are, you know, can you be a brand manager, a brand strategist, a product marketer, a product mm -hmm. manager, mm -hmm. a consultant for an agency or a consultant for that? Like, they don't really know the world of possibilities. And I do think they, I mean, they're seeing things like on TikTok with these day in the lives, which are pros and cons to that. And actually some of them are a little cringe and also set expectations really high, like I've seen you mention before. And then also at least there's some sort of a, an awareness uh, that we can like talk to and, and show that there's a possibility of something else. So if you're a designer that loves that, but maybe you want to see more of the experience and want to like become more of a leader as far as like the business perspective and help things come alive. Uh, I've actually gotten a lot of good feedback from students that are like, wow, I didn't really know this would be a possibility for me. Uh, it's something I haven't thought of. Like I still want a little bit of a connection to the experience to design, but maybe this is actually a path for me, maybe in three years after becoming a UX designer or something else. No, but it's really interesting. So is there stuff that you see that over stuff that you see people come with a certain assumption and they're like, they come out of it and they're like, oh, you know, like, as you said, I didn't know that this existed or other things that maybe they thought that product management was like, as you said, in a TikTok video, like going in the morning, having your cappuccino and then, and then going on lunch and all that. And you, you say to him, no, it's not really like a product manager. I love some of those videos are so well done. There's one I'm thinking in particular, I don't want to call it because I actually love it. Like the lighting is incredible. It's beautiful. And I think the person's probably a phenomenal product manager, but you can't really film you like moving things around on, on Jira for four hours for confidentiality reasons. And also no one would watch that unless it's like just pure torture watching paint dry. But like, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely some discovery of, of what you like. I'd love to see education do more of that. It is kind of weird that we have all of this pressure to decide a career when you're like, you know, 18 to 20 or earlier, maybe sometimes in Europe and without like getting a taste for like what it's like. I really wish we could do more ride alongs and more sort of internships that are like more like you're a part of the role. But this at least gives us a little window. Although, I mean, we'll talk about like, you know, what is, what do you design an education on that's like conceptual background info? What's the actual a sort of info that's like one-time setup or like strategy <clears throat> sort of pieces that are early on. And then like, what is the day-to-day -day more? So, and, and there's some tension there. I don't think I have that dialed in. There's a lot to kind of uncover there, but uh, you know, like a lot of the classic thing with consulting is like, oh, you do all the strategy work. And then, yeah, you're like on an implementation and business transformation project for like eight years <laughs> doing yeah. something like that. And you're like, oh, what happened to the strategy? Uh, well, it's not always that. It's not always that. And so what do you think about the education market? Because a lot of people came out, you know, with, and I think because there was a need in the market, you know, that we needed something else than universities. Also in university, it was not necessarily taught, you know, what is product? Like, I think it came really late, a certificate in product management and all that. What do you think about the, the education market in, in that area? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, early on, of course, I did one of the like general assembly boot camps, of course, like that was one of the things to do uh, around 10 years ago. And, and it's still out there. And there's pros and cons to that as well. But I put them in the three buckets of you have like the education programs, uh, which I did a whole review of this this summer when I was designing the curriculum to sort of see, you know, what it used to be and what it's now and how it's changed a little bit. So, you know, looking at the curriculums, like maybe Northwestern's executive education product management program and all of the courses that are there, SU um Carnegie Mellon things like that to see what's out there then I put it in the, the bucket of the you know product school general assembly product collective like all of those and then you have the uh black blots pragmatic marketing AI PMM uh certifications and yeah. everything and it's interesting to see that evolution so like what I try to do is like backtrack from the output for it so when you look at like maybe the final presentation which my students have one coming up uh next week and this is the first time we're doing it. And when I looked at, you know, General Assembly, when I look at that deck that everyone gives, it's really a Y Combinator pitch deck. That's basically, I think, what that evolved out of, maybe some other programs as well. 
Um, and for all the pros and cons to that and all the memes we have on Twitter, like, you know, the first slide was the Tam Sam Som addressable markets. And then they're like, oh, you have to have that slide. And then there's all these other threads on LinkedIn and everything like that slide is stupid. And then you're like, well, you need something. <laughs> so yeah. you need something to, to show like, market, you know, market, market opportunity. Like, yeah, but it, but it's normal. Like it, it feels also a bit like, you know, big consulting firm, right? The, the Tam Sam and all that, it's also like what you get, for example, from you know, BCG Ventures and all those kind of companies that are helping, you know, make executive decisions. So, so what is your, so what is the, what, what do you consider that should be in this pitch deck, I will say at the end? Yeah, that's a tough call. I was actually struggling with that quite a bit this week when I'm, you know, assigning them this presentation and, you know, I have those mixed feelings too, but then again, you do want to show some sort of analysis of like market opportunity. So I guess like I'm not as tied down to exactly what form like i'm having them do it so i don't want to say it's bad but i will say like have it in your mind that there's caveats around it and that you know you'll probably be triggered by having that there and say you have to have it and some won't but that's kind of a good lesson in a lot of these presentations as well you really just have to know your audience and what their expectations are and it's something i've always thought was kind of a bit maddening in business or relationships where they say everybody has to have it like this and then you talk to the next person and it's the exact opposite. I did a lot of consulting for startups in uh, Seattle and had some great venture funded ones and then you'd have two people that got funding from like different venture capital firms give you the exact opposite of advice. So maybe there's a lesson there too as well. You just got to choose and put something out there and iterate and go for it. Yeah, it, it, it's and so like also, Y Combinator changed a lot of stuff. Also, like also there is uh, like the startup school. Um, I think it changed. I think they changed their name like to Library or Learning. I don't. I don't remember. I think the, the website changed where you can learn also some stuff. But I think Y Combinator yeah, also yeah. changed a lot of things on on how to create the speech deck. Did you take inspiration also from that or your experience and other stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's some fun uh, pitch deck teardowns. There's one with uh, Gary Tan, who's now leading. Y Combinator that's up there uh, about a year ago. I just posted that one for the students to sort of lo learn from. And it's fun because they go slide by slide through it and just, you know, some of it's, you know, teasing them a little bit on some of the things they see, but there's, and it's not just on like the market opportunity and those things, um, but like the statements of their goals and their customers. And it does get into then actual like product feedback on, on how things work and and everything like that from almost even a UX UI perspective. So that's a lot of fun, but it's amazing to see like the change from like YouTube's pitch deck or uh, DoorDash's Y Combinator pitch from like 2014 or whatever that was. And I mean, like watch that, that one's still up there on their channel and it's, you know, good. Well, like YouTube's is kind of not good, but they have an incredible idea. Then <laughs> DoorDash's was good, but like not very professional. Then look at maybe Techstars, Austin, 20, uh, walk through of their um, candidates there, like multiple that are just so professional on point, just a few bullets on the screen, just crisp and dialed in. And it's uh, amazing how professionalized this has gotten. But I mean, I, I guess I would counsel that like these things are now so polished that it's almost like the same thing that happened with Instagram. It's not necessarily like the quality of capturing the emotion and the authenticity. It's just like perfect in that way and maybe a little style over substance but i think it's both because i think they're you know in a good way pressuring them to be better at, at substance and have things dialed in but that early maybe it's going to be completely pivoted away anyway so yeah it's interesting because you know i remember this presentation and i was i was watching that bag because i'm doing it right now uh, for the contract I'm working in. You know, I was watching the Steve Jobs presentation, like the old ones, you know, like the, the, the 2000, like launching the first uh, iPod and everything. Because for me, it's really good pitch deck presentation. You know, you start with a problem. What is the problem in the market? What did they do? Why did they do it? And this is the product they built. Except you have already a final product and everything and they're launching it. So it's a bit, it's a bit different. But then after that, I always like go back to Airbnb investment deck because it's like it's like a classic for me like it's like you know the one that you should get but i just wonder if you know in the education part we're teaching people at a certain point it was like we teach them to get funding and not necessarily to get a good idea yeah well, that's what i struggle with too because when i'm looking at that it's really focused just on that uh initial yeah. idea and everything and maybe and then 
to teach it with like a full fledged demo wouldn't be product management. It would be more, you know, UX slash development combination. Like maybe there's some sort of a capstone course that covers that. And we, we do do things like that but it's not just on product management, which it is kind of the struggle of picking something that is an interdisciplinary role to do that. So I, for all of our assignments, we do have more of a like window that touches those. So like, you know, creating a uh, user flow, but like not in the level of detail that a UX person would just kind of map it out and, you know, use tools like Mobbin that kind of already have a lot of those things out there. Um, so I'm not really grading per se on the excellence of the user flow, but like on your product thinking of like, you know, trying to make sure your happy path of like sort of makes sense. And that like the mm -hmm. features mm -hmm. you propose, like where, where are they going? Like, you know, so that's kind of where I try to focus it and try to use like tools that like we actually would use or they're kind of emerging tools, which is another thing I'm trying to get, you know, a little bit ahead of things. So even if that new tool that's, you know, AI based or something, isn't something that sticks around that function will probably be built in the tools that we'll, we'll use soon. Even saw product discovery on, on Jira launch like this week. So like things like that are, are kind of coming up there and I want to like, you know, spark their imagination on how they're going to be doing that next. And so what is, since you have done the, I have two questions that are coming one more, maybe not controversial, but that will go into the deep. But my first question is. What do you think is missing? You know, since you have seen the market, you're doing it right now. So you see also the challenges, you know, of doing it. What do you think is missing in the education part? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely that the day to day gap. And I know there's like a struggle with that. And I mean, the power of like a university education is beyond like a technical education where you're thinking deeper about things philosophically. That's why you get like a doctorate of philosophy when you get a PhD. Right. But like mm -hmm. you also get into this like framework jumble of semantics that every discipline has, whether it's data storytelling, product management, like it, it's like that. And you also don't want them to just become like technical in there in JIRA. I think having like a good balance of like grounded in principles that are clear, uh, that aren't just buzzwordy, you could reword it like, and anyone can understand it. I, I really think anyone, like even a regular elementary school teacher, I think actually could be a product manager. I think we could get them up to speed uh, correctly. And I think in essentialized, like um, the material on YouTube for product management in the last year, as far as podcasts is incredible. But kind of looking back on just like the actual connection of what do you do next it is pretty weak. And that's why I like to take like one, two hour lectures. And then after I, you know, work with my editor to get it down, it's really more like, you know, seven to 20 minutes. And in the age of uh, short form video, but like TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, we can't give someone a, an hour video. They're not going to watch it. I yeah. know you talked on, about learning styles in, in November or whatever. I think that's huge on like both seeing it and receiving it with all the flash, flashy graphics, but then they won't remember those flashy graphics, which is one of the latest studies, but how do you get them to actually then do something right there to apply it and then it'll stick. And so what is, so if we go, if we go deeper in that, if I ask you a question directly, what is your critique that you will say on what it's happening in the education market in from what you see and what you do, you know, how you test it also in class, which is also different from maybe how some people, you know, put it on LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever. What what is your critique that you that you felt from that market? Yeah. I mean, I think like clarity and applying it like day to day in a space that's imperfect. So like a lot of these things are not what is set up in the companies themselves that you're at. So, I mean, if you've got a well-oiled machine and you're executing or like open AI or like Google a while ago or something like that, like you've got a process, you've got like the way to set up A-B tests at Amazon is ingrained in their entire software that runs that entire company. It's built in, it's there. Some of the other things aren't been built in, maybe like reporting or something, but when you're somewhere else, like you're the one that's in charge of advocating often for setting those things up for why you should even test should you prioritize them how where do you set it up do you do it in jira trello somewhere else more casually and i think that's uh like role as an advocate for that and not expecting everything to be there set in place uh there's a metaphor i use sometimes with american football and systems 
I'm sure it works for soccer as well. We could do Ted Lasso, but they usually have like a system for those teams. And when you step into a high functioning system, it's already got all these things in place. They already have the days you practice. They have the days you learn, the days you watch a video, all that sort of stuff. And you just step into your role. And so Patrick Mahomes for the Kansas City Chiefs can step into an Andy Reid system and then, you know, learn and grow and be incredibly successful. But if you step in somewhere else and that system isn't there, it's a lot on you to also set up all of those pieces. So it can be more difficult and not as successful unless you're like ready to create those uh, processes and workflows and do all the communication and persuasion to make it happen. And it's quite interesting the way you present it because it's a, it's a reflection I was having some time ago. I believe like you, that everybody can be a product manager. You know, if you teach them, doesn't matter what they do. You know, you can you can teach them, you know, the principle of product management and they can do that. But as you said, there is certain context that they are so hard that let's say going after university where you are lacking experience, you know, because you have zero experience except, you know, the discussion you had at university makes it really hard. So I guess the question for you is that do you do you believe that people can be product managers right away? Or you think that they need to go through maybe certain roles or certain step before aiming to be a product manager? Or is it just a question of context? I think they need to explore those areas. Like I ended up doing a UX boot camp before I even became a product manager. and I wasn't very good at it. I had a great idea. That was the one we mentioned before when we were talking about using Twitter empathy to uncover what someone's really saying instead of the actual words they're using, using compassionate communication. Um, so I think that actually helped me, even though like my visual designs were not good. I am not a designer. No one can mistake me for that, but I was definitely able to understand now, like when I ask for something, how to phrase it and like, what's, you know, more or more easy or more difficult to create from that perspective. I mean, I think you could, you know, cover that in a lot of ways that could just be design jam sessions that you spend extra time on where you normally wouldn't, and you'd be less involved in at first. And, and I had a lot of fun with my designers on a lot of projects uh, in the last few years. And I think that helped me develop that uh, sense as well. So as far as like getting past the gatekeeping of product management, which is the, one of the most incredibly gatekeep roles I've ever experienced. I struggled with that a lot to get into my current role. And mm -hmm. I really empathize with everyone trying to break in. It's not easy. Um, but I think some sort of signaling. So we always talk about like signaling. Is that an MBA? Is that a certificate? Is that a boot camp? And I mean, that's what I did. I took that General Assembly boot camp to put it on the resume so that someone saw project management would poison on my LinkedIn to a lot of startups that are looking for a product manager because they didn't trust my product sense would be there. Uh, how do you communicate that you have a product sense and have that different lens? And I think you can do that a lot of different ways, but just anything you can do with those words in it, whether it's directly or indirectly, I think helps. Since you talk about, about product sense, I, I'm, I'm interested to have like the, the teacher opinion. What is, what is product sense? How do you, how do you teach that to your, uh, to your students? I mean, yeah, it's kind of, how do you, how do you teach something that's more artistic, like taste or whatever? I know it's classic, like. Steve Jobs, Microsoft quotes is the one I use in my Grizz PM video on YouTube. It's a little harsh, but uh, definitely true if you compare, especially earlier Microsoft products, maybe a little less now, I don't know. But uh, I think it's, it's definitely just thinking through it in a way that is slightly more artistic and having a deeper curiosity to something than uh, just putting the boxes and text on the screen that accomplishes the function and to have a way with it that is like easeful and even, you know, beautiful or somehow aesthetically pleasing and smooth and gives you a different feeling. So I don't know how much we can really truly teach on it, but I think examples help uh, a lot uh, in comparison. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's beyond just like UI, but like, I think you can start with that. Like you can, the example that got me the, the current job I'm in in my interview or whatever, we had that classic question on what's an app that does something well and one that does something not well. And there's one I absolutely love. And I want to shout out to the product managers at Mila Air Purifiers, incredible app. And then there's another one for a smart air conditioner that I have. I won't name it, maybe, but it's terrible. And like the UI itself is, there's a very simple one. Like if you ever had like a car from the nineties or eighties, they have like the red 
in the blue for air conditioning and heat. And it's like instantaneously, everyone knows how to use that. And then this one like flips everything around and it's like impossible to use and the numbers don't match up with how it works. And it's like, what happened here? Like it should be a very basic, easy thing to, to cover. And it was, it's actually kind of counterintuitive versus Mila has this well-developed app with like a lot of data. It has sensors for like all sorts of things in your air from like carbon dioxide to different particles, all those. And it's similar smart home app, um, like many of them, but it's done in a way that is like, joyful it has like copy that's fun but serious like i still trust them to be accurate but it's uh got a lot of data but the graphs are like really understandable and come up at the right time uh you can adjust it in a way that's like you know auto magic and bubble boy mode and you know what bubble boy mode <laughs> like is it's like super clean in the air so like that sense for like how to make it both like serious and fun and designed well like it's all combined into like a masterfully done product. So I tip my hat to the people at the Mila air purifier company. I really need an affiliate code for that or something, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Can see that in, your, in one of your, uh, one of your video when you talk, when you talk about that. And so you, you were talking about, you know, part of it is emerging technology also of what you're teaching. Yeah. And so in, so what is, what is emerging technology? What is the, the part in there? What does it cover? Well, I mean, it depends on the different courses in our curriculum, but we cover a lot of different things. We have other classes that even teach like projection mapping and AR and VR and game design. And then for us in products, it's like we've got a number of different things we can do. And I know like AI is totally a huge other subject, but there's like how do you use it in your day to day life in the role? And then there's how do you design AI ML applications or like how is it incorporated into regular applications? And all of these things are merging. So I'm really trying to incorporate it at the basic level. I mean, you have like the chat LLMs, of course, and all of them are using it. So mm -hmm. November mm -hmm. last year, every student immediately using uh, at least chat GPT. There's a few other like homework tailored ones that like Olivia Dunn like mentioned and they got in trouble with LSU and a lot of stuff like that. Um, but if you're a teacher anywhere that has exams, quizzes, whatever, you're done. Like that's over. Like they are going to be using it on every single one. It's like trying to stop calculators and it's even more powerful than a calculator. It's the most powerful tool like humankind has ever seen. You're going to tell them to be like, oh, don't use that anymore. They're going to use it. So I think there's, I assign it in almost all of my cases, but like it's tricky to find a way to use it so that you're powerful and you're learning, but you get too much. So like for prioritization frameworks, you do an assignment on that. There's 38 different ways that I counted. I don't want to teach 38. And I don't think it's valuable. And you're almost overwhelmed with the options. You can ask it to be like, what are the top few? But like, you basically have to curate it for them and do coaching. So I think the role of a teacher, wherever you are now, is much more valuable as a coach. You've got these incredible experts on YouTube that are just masterful content creators. And do you have access to them to be able to be coached and guided a little bit? So like, you know, I can do the best with my YouTube videos. And I think of a college professor or a university professor, they're probably in the upper range, not as good as like, you know, the ones that have like huge budgets and everything, but like, what is the value that I can offer to a student? How do they receive something out of it? I think it's like getting that curation first and then getting kind of a, a coaching and feedback iteration after that. Okay. So you see that it's, it's changing at the same time for the education itself, because you know, most of the content is accessible, even too much content is accessible. I will say from what you're saying, I didn't know there was like 30, 30 something prioritization framework. I didn't know that. I knew like quite a few. I didn't know, I didn't know there was 30. I don't want to discover the 30. I'm going to sue you. Uh, I'm going to stay with a few I know. But you, you're saying that where it's changing education is that people should take that into account and transform themselves more as a coach where they share experiences. Is it what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like a lot of things, but tailoring it to their interests and giving them choice and giving them, you know, recent examples. Like a lot of us went through all these programs and I mean, if you go to an MBA, you're getting all the HBR case studies. You're going to get all of those. We're, we're tired of yeah. Gala Winery and P&G and all of that. There's actually a great uh, education video from uh, Sinead from Canada and Alex Manu, one of my professors from Toronto, talking about this where they're just like, give us the recent app examples that we can apply. I think that's a huge problem in education and analytics. Like we use 
store data like in tableau's default store data like you know we are digital it should be absolutely like using at least google analytics and adobe if not something like pendo or like something um, that's using shopify data i'm really shocked that for our industry we're not like training with actual stuff and part of that's on these companies and tools like i really don't want to talk to a 50 sales person to get access to a tool for a demo file we need to have it available for education and some of the big ones like you know the the tableaus and those sort of uh, software um, pieces offer an education program but, and i know it's a lot for small startups to ask but like i have seen some great examples in the product area of allowing us to use tools as a demo and be able to get students ready to like do the day to day, although I really don't want to set up a Jira instance now. But it's but it's interesting about what you said because I remember when I was in university in Canada, so not in not in Europe because I don't think this kind of this kind of partnership exists really in Europe. But when I was a uh, they are coming, but it's not there yet. When I was a, a student in Canada, I remember that you know you got access to office for free and you got access to you know those kind of tools directly, and that way you were used to it, and then afterwards you were still continuing to use it after being a student. So it's quite interesting that in the field, like nobody was saying, okay, like now there is education in that part. And so we should also give them that and be able like to capture them, you know, when they're still student. Yeah. I'd like to see some, something more focused towards like actual practice. Like you play the role and they have, I've seen the older versions of that in NBA where you like practice being a marketer and then you move something up on the two by two positioning scale, which is like a little weird, but it is kind of fun in that game sense of like how you you know find product market fit or how you do something like that i do think there could be some fun way to do that more as a game i would like it if it was like actually using you know close to real tools for you know user testing or um user analytics like a, you know a mock shopify site or something like that i mean it is kind of a struggle too because one thing we haven't talked about as much too is like the difference between you know a startup a you know growing unicorn all the way through uh, the fortune 100 and all of that and you know what scenario you're training someone for is completely different whether that's a medium scale shopify or a massive you know server with you know ibm databases you know going through billions of dollars so it's quite a bit different what you might teach and so how how do you teach that and how do you teach this will be my second question because i understand you can teach on frameworks and you can teach on prioritization and decks and all that but i know from experience but one of the things that people struggle with is stakeholder management right and so my question is how do you how do you teach that or how do you help people understand what that means and being able to be proficient in that. I don't know if we'll get it that deep in 14 weeks. What I do cover on stakeholders the most comes up around more around the presentation time than earlier. I think I'll have to find a way to work it in before, but the audience questions I really go deep on. Um, maybe it's me and the like consultant uh, in me where I really like the dossier of a person uh, that's really deep. But in both of the classes I teach, I kind of go deep. Like the Duarte group has a great set of questions for your audience uh, that kind of drives into what their interests are. I think that's a huge gap for someone that's quote green, the insult of someone new, especially straight out of university, um, which we all were, and like learning to kind of speak to someone else's needs. And that, you know, when you're leading a presentation, it's not about you, it's about the audience and what's mm -hmm, important mm -hmm. to you out there. And then uncovering like what the needs are you know are they like you know is the industry just going completely down and they've got the board right on them or you know what what's the context that they have do they need to pay for private school and they don't have enough in, in the stock options so uh i don't know um but thinking about whatever their context is is huge and i know that can get into a little bit of like politics between different groups but i think the students are able to really like pick up on like oh yeah if i'm permit presenting to the VP of e-commerce that's different than if I'm presenting to like the VP of marketing or the VP of products or you know some other role like that it does have a different lens and so you want to speak to those needs so we actually cover that in, into depth a little bit uh, so I think that helps and there's also an overlap when we talk about uh, customers too I have like the both feeling and needs wheels, which I know some people don't like the wheels feels a little childish but I love them because you get to articulate exactly like what they're feeling in that like level of uh, feeling or need. 
and to sort of dial that in, whether it's for a customer or it's for your, your stakeholders. And do you see, do you see like, because we're talking about emerging technology, do you see that, for example, AI is helping in that or is transforming our role? Yeah, hundred percent. I am really curious where this is going. Cause like, you know, and I talked about UX in like 2007 and eight and like just kind of appearing there uh, very quickly in getting caught on. I mean, just in the last few weeks, we had like big jam AI, like be able to immediately create like, wireframes that you can quickly get over to prototypes and then you know spout to like webflow or and things like that and so we did practice that in class um since we're not oh, cool. the designers uh and i can't teach that because they've got a whole other set of classes for that it's like oh wow like so for our demo we're actually going to have you know some decent uh options there that are created and you can kind of iterate it uh, on it or whatever and you know i know everyone's talking about like oh well you know there'll still always be need for a human like yes and like between you and me and a student together, we could actually get like a lot more done. So is it that we get 40% more done or 50% more done and we have, you know, a little bit more quality and a little bit faster? I think that's great. And so uh, we practiced that as well. We had like Octopus, the tool, make site maps in like a few seconds. That's something that would have taken us a week and we can just do it in one quick assignment. So if anything, the assignments are getting shorter. I don't really know how to make them any longer and harder, but uh, maybe things will just be a little more efficient. And so what is your uh, recommendation, I will say, for people that are out there that are looking at that and they're thinking like, how is it going to change my role? Yes, absolutely. I think the way I see it is getting to not just like ask it for the answer and then have that output that you do need to cultivate, whether it's product sense or contextual knowledge or a little bit of a, a vision where you're going to be curating that and making a decision probably sooner than later. So instead of a like group product manager, that would be like years later, perhaps like early, earlier on, you're going to need to have that skill set. Cause like what value would you add if all you're doing is typing in a prompt, even if it's a really super good prompts, you know, I don't know how long that's going to last as like a super valued skill, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, anyone else can type that in. So like, why would a company hire you? Like it's got to be the value in addition to that. And uh, I think you could cultivate that and uh, be super efficient. It's just uh, maybe taking more ownership of that point of view, kind of like we always talk about being a consultant. It's like they're not just there to like execute on a project. They are there because they're asking for your point of view and your experience and to be able to help them make choices. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Like, especially what you said about the value that you're bringing. As you said, you know, if you're just pushing buttons, do you need to have a title or does it need to be thought about again you know what are you what are you bringing on the table and so if we if we if we go towards like kind of a kind of one of a piece you know uh inside product what is what is the place of leadership inside the inside the curriculum that you have how much do you teach on that that is question i don't think i've covered that as much yet uh we've got a couple of days left do you have any advice i could i could have what is your what is what is your position on leadership and, and product. That is a big topic. Are we guiding leaders or are we becoming a leader ourselves within the function? What's the take? That's I mean, the question. I think it's, I mean, how can we advocate for the customer? And then how can we advocate for our ability to advocate for the customer within our organization, which I think is where we lose the leadership and we lose the credibility is just losing sight of that. And then losing that confidence to be able to push more for uh, that higher quality connected uh, experience. Uh, I think being a leader is doing that when no one wants you to do that. And they, I don't think most people realize going into a career that like, it, it's not about making everyone happy. It's about following what you think is right to create and then taking the flack that you need to do that. So you may leave a company and people may still think you were incorrect in your leadership and vision. And it may have been correct just because someone said so on a performance review or somewhere else. Uh, it's almost comical when you choose a company that like failed spectacularly that was prior successful. So if you look at, you can choose Canadian Blackberry is always the hilarious example of uh, when the writing was absolutely on the wall, you, had, you know, board members that were incredibly insightful and innovative and they still couldn't move that. So there's probably thousands of people that had a strong product vision that would have helped them go on par with Apple and maybe Motorola at the time or whatever. And they had a vision and weren't able to persuade and win. So like, had they been able to 
lead in that way could have been a different story. Yeah, but I mean, what you just said about taking a direction, believing in it, and people may still believe you're wrong, even if you leave a company, is quite, is quite powerful. I quite like that quote because it's, it's true that, you know, when you're leading a certain way, it's going in a certain direction, but you believe it. And so whatever happens is the direction you believe in. Are you going to be successful in the direction? Nobody knows. And I think this is what you discover also, like in the time that you're doing it. And what I think we should be more honest in the, in the education part, because it seems sometimes it's just like, oh yeah, use this framework and you're going to succeed, you know, feels a bit too, too colorful and too like, you know, like everything is, everything is happy and everything is going to work out where in reality, what you said is really the truth about this job, which is you have a vision, you build your vision, then you decide to go that way. You try to bring people with you, but then it works or it doesn't. That's the only thing you have control of. I have a question for you from, uh, I I have a question for you from uh, last week. What's the biggest mistake in leadership you've ever made? Let me think that one through. That is tough. I mean, there's like, product ones there's also like stakeholder and then hmm let me see it almost feel like an interview question (laughs) it does feel like an interview question if it's a real interview question you have to choose something where you can just flip it back around and say i fix it all that's kind of the (laughs) the structure that was really not that big of a mistake because i completely fixed it in a few minutes yeah i I think this is going to be kind of an interesting one. So I had an incredibly high performing team for an e-commerce client for like many years. And we were actually executing so well on so many things, like launching things in like six weeks and kind of like jealous of that, looking back on it, where we found that flow and we're doing that sort of thing. And the team changed a little bit uh, as things went on and they were all very high performing individually. And we were great at some things about being vulnerable and being critical. Um, But we, when we're doing it well, we had like all sorts of little traditions that worked. We had like a designated optimist because all our, you know, products would be like up and down on how things were doing. And we'd hand them this little statue and and they would have to be optimistic temporarily. But when we shifted to this other form, I think the vulnerability turned into a lot of complaints versus uh, being able to like move through those uh, constructively. And I think giving everyone um, too much power to have the complaints and not move forward, really kind of the team devolved uh, around that. Um, and then we wrapped up. So I think there's a way to create that constructive conflict and work through those where it doesn't just become uh, permanent venting. So maybe you have your, uh, your subject on, on leadership for your, uh, for your students. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to read their performance reviews on the class feedback form at some point soon, which is always entertaining. A lot of learning and growth there. Also, sometimes they go for the jugular. So it'll be fun to read those uh, and, you know, cry yourself to sleep, either joyfully or the other way. And so what will be your question for a next guest? Because it's the time, like, what will be what will be the question? Yeah, maybe we do something like this uh, product management education thing. Like, what do you think it is uh, the future of teaching product management like what would you teach that doesn't currently exist there like specifically that's an interesting question what do you think if you had to answer that question since you're teaching it i think i answered a little bit of it during this whole thing but uh teaching more towards creating the experiences that users uh, will thrive in and make our company's money in a way that's more like we would do day to day for like a medium sized company, uh, not just like you said, just to get funding for a small subsets of super awesome, interesting little startups. And now that you now that you teach product management, did your outlook on the job change? Do you feel different from before teaching it? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm even more tired of the frameworks. Oh, really? Uh, Tell me more. <laughs> I want to know more about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's a pro and con to it because I want to stay grounded in the principles and not just be a Jira clicker. At the same time, it's just really a little bit uh, frustrating. And then when you record a video about something, and a lot of people talked about this too, like when you come off as authentic in a conversation like this, it's a little bit easier, but then you're like, what are the seven things of whatever? Like on LinkedIn, it's like, oh, this just sounds so trite and so useless. It's like the 
80, 90% of stuff you don't remember from university. It's like the sevens. Well, heck, I don't care. Like, so like uh, the, that the, kind of the marketing, the marketing plan is... and the pestle and the, you know, when I hear about that, when people are like, yeah, we can do a pestle. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like an MBA. Let's come back on that. I know. And like NPS and whatever replaces it. And then another thing or uh, ARR and then now NRR, which yeah, our new video will cover all of those growth metrics. So check that out on Chris PM. <laughs> but like, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of me doing that. So I'm like even more tired of that. And then there's also the like jargon that consultants use. I mean, we were talking about digital transformation the other day or whatever, but all mm -hmm. of these things, like, can we speak about it like a normal person? Can you just describe it to a grandma or a 12 year old. I do love that about chat GPT. I think that's great on like, explain it to me like I'm someone else because I do want us to move a little bit more towards articulating things like a human being, um, which ironically chat GPT, JIRA, prioritization, all that sort of stuff. And really want to get deeper connected to like building great products and experiences for customers and, and talk to them more. So I think maybe my passion is just focusing more on that side versus some of the mechanics that even seem less agile and more waterfall style yeah. than I would have ever expected. To be honest, I have the same I have the same feeling as you. Like we shared that in our discussion that I have a feeling that we lost we lost a bit, you know, the beginning of building product where there was this frenzy to build products and we didn't know if it will work. We were not really looking at how we were building it. It was pretty messy. But you know, when we went towards this thing where you're like you, you see like people talking, you have the impression that you don't do things the right way. And I, I remember I had the discussion also in another podcast where it's like, I think it was last week uh, with Antonia, where we were discussing about that. And it was like, I think some books have created more problems when they helped, you know, the field. Because it was like given this beautiful framework and this beautiful way of working that is not applicable to to most of the companies. And so you feel this yeah. pressure, which is a bit weird. Absolutely. Yeah, the day-to-day -day versus uh, the academic has always been kind of interesting. It's fun to see that in other industries. Like I saw that in supply chain where like the classes and operations had 0% to do with what you know I did on a, a factory floor at the pickle factory, which is kind of fun uh, to see software operating there but like all of these like calculations for whip and all those things and then nothing there and now it's funny to see that in product management where i thought it would be a lot closer and maybe like we're talking about it's some of the things that's done at the outsets but not in the like iterative fashion where like it shouldn't be like you talk to the customer when the company is founded and then you don't ever talk to them again that seems a bit odd um, there is a lot of sensitivity on cost to like, you know, bringing in, doing service. There are like affordable, easier ways to do that. And you can get uh, customers that are like the trusted ones where like, if you show them a screen and the like logos and in the right place, they won't, you know, post that somewhere or whatever. And you can have agreements to do that. And I think, you know, making sure you have people that you can connect with along the way to actually look at something and get out of your head and see what it you know works with a real person would be great. I mean, just by interacting in all the products we use on a day-to-day -day basis from this Sony camera here, which has very rough software, very bad uh, difficulties in connecting to uh, this laptop. It's like, and they clearly have not tested it enough with users. And that's one of the largest, most storied, most historical, incredible companies in, in the world. So if they're not doing it as well as they can, then wow, like what are the rest of us doing? Uh, I think we could just advocate more for that. And you know, I love that company. So I'm going to advocate that they hire some great product managers like us. Like, I like that. I like that. I like the, I like the spirit of it for uh, advocating for that. So if I ask you the last three questions, what do you hope will be your legacy or lasting impact in digital and leadership and product management? Yeah, absolutely. I think I would just like to uh, make it a little more fun a little more interesting together as we build things and a little less boring and create a little better products that make our lives better, whatever it is doing uh, in a small way, um, but have fun doing it. Any leaders that you, you follow or a book, movie, TV show you recommend for, for new leaders or people that are looking into product? I'm you a know, big fan of entertainment. So I'm a big fan of entertainment, so this is why, you know, like you can say something more traditional and then you can say something more different, you know, if you if you know a movie or something like that, that is, that is quite interesting. Yeah, I do have a really different movie that has probably never been recommended in this regard. Yeah, I mean, for product management, all those lists for books are out there are great. Um, I'll have a couple of boring recommendations that are a little bit different on books, but there's a movie that no one will probably download because of the title, but it has most up the rapper in it so that if that helps pitch it. 
as well, um, but it's about innovation and it's called Something the Lord Made. And it's about the first heart surgeries uh, because at one time heart surgeries were deemed impossible and that they would never happen. And okay. you'll see this pattern in all innovation now because people are like, oh, you know, here's the naysayers and you won't always recognize it because it will be someone that sounds crazy. And so the first heart surgeon, there's, you know, a true story behind it with like, you know, World War One trauma and all these things. And then it was this pairing, which is an incredible story between these two men of this, this carpenter played by most deaf. Uh, and the surgeon, so the carpenter had like, you know, could make the tiny little incisions, but the, the lessons around innovation with that one just really stuck with me on how much until they got their Nobel prize and like the whole path through that, it was just like, this is an impossible thing. You can't do it. And so anytime someone's doing something innovative and I start to see those news articles and I just kind of immediately like my red flags up, but even when it's something, you know, small and we're doing it. And there's, you know, a different way of doing a UI or like, I can imagine the first person that like, you know, suggested the swipe left or right on there for, for Tinder was probably like, oh, you can't do that. That's like not a normal UI. And we laugh at it now because it's so ingrained and we're like, yeah. oh, we won't be that dumb. But it's a check on me. So anytime I do see some some kind of different proposal, I'm, I try not to use language that's like definitive, like that must be bad or that's wrong. That should be this way. Instead, being like, I don't see how that you know might work or whatever, but you know, let customers decide, or maybe it's someone else's jam in their product. You know, let them try. Um, I'll try something different, but I try not to just like have those kind of statements. So I think that's one of my innovation uh, recommendations. You know, besides the normal Clayton Christensen stuff, which is great as well. And what is the one video from a Greece PM that you recommend? that people should watch. Ooh, there's an intro to product management that's 44 minutes long. So if you want to cool. get it all in one, in one shot, there it is. Uh, that one's pretty pretty fun to rock through. I will put the link in the it. comment on YouTube if people want to watch it. But yeah, okay. Yeah, it's good. That's good. That's uh, a good one. Uh, absolutely. And shout out to my editor too. She's absolutely amazing, Jean. So yeah, I couldn't do nowhere near that amazing level of graphics and everything and to like help uh you know distill that story so whether you you know do your own editing or anything like thinking through like the storyline of everything help to really you know clarify your thinking and make things crisp so uh, whether you're presenting as a product manager for your your funding or you're creating content for the same thing i think it's really helpful to have another person's uh you know eyes on it that's cool And uh, yeah, we'll shout out to her. Um, and for and so my third question, uh, so for emerging leader or people that are new, you know, to the field, what's one piece of advice you wish you'd receive earlier in your career? Yeah, well, this is like the, you know, the post 30 or post 40 year old answer is way less about like, you know, business or technical skills or anything like that. And is way more around like, so cliche but like so true like psychology and self-growth and communication whereas like communication when you're younger i think it's like just this boring class that's kind of like english adjacent to that and like really going deeper in those workshops over like the last decade like what are there and there's a lot of flavors and everyone has their opinions on which are good which are more like a cult or not like a cult so there's a lot of that out there but i found a lot of value going through that and being able to be like self-aware of my own emotions and what other people are thinking and have that like dance between what you need and what they need. It just completely unlocks your ability to communicate and advocate for what you want in every arena of life and business and personal and beyond. And so the sooner you can find something like that, that, you know, resonates with you and has the structure you want that, you know, speaks to your, your style that maybe is a little bit weird, but still helpful for you, I think would have opened up a lot more for me like 10 years earlier but i know it takes a little while for you to like you know have the necessary challenges and struggles and pain points to you know have that open up for most people but give it a shot yeah I just have a feeling that it comes with age i have exactly the same reflections like yeah maybe it comes just with age with time it just come come there um and so where can we find you yeah on youtube i'm at grizz 2 z's pm and then on twitter well there's at business taylor or if it's just product management at unsolicited pm so that as well good Uh, we're reaching the end. Thank you so much for this discussion. It was really interesting and uh, really good to have your opinion uh, as someone that is in the education also field to see uh, what you're doing there. So thank you so much for coming to the Digital Leadership Podcast. Do you have something else? Uh, one, one last word before we finish that, uh, that streaming? Uh, 
rock out your products and do awesome. Add a little riz, add a little style, and let's make this fun. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Taylor. Thanks, Phil.